Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host and producer, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. I want to welcome regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser. How are you doing, Emily? Good morning, Olga. Happy daylight savings time to you. Happy daylight savings time to you. I'm feel I don't know about you, but I'm not quite breaking through the daylight savings haze yet. Um, and John Walters, our other guest of the political uh, the Vermont Political Observer, shaking his head too. <laughs> at the customary, uh, absolutely impossible to fall asleep at any reasonable hour on Sunday night. Oh so, dear. It. Uh, the, the worst part of this in my entire life was I, I was uh, a morning host for, Yogo, you know this, I uh, do. <laughs> on, on a radio station for a number of years. And uh, the Monday after daylight saving time started was the worst day of the year, mm-hmm. followed by the Tuesday after the Monday. Yes. So yep. I love daylight savings time. And I... Um, a few years ago, I was hosting this legislative training and I was looking for a piece of legislation that like was good to use for a training because everyone had an opinion, but like wasn't controversial, you know, mm-hmm. so we could just like use it as an object lesson. And so I used this daylight savings piece of legislation and I did not realize how significantly I am in the minority in my love for daylight savings. Like I, th- I love having my r- routine be interrupted twice a year. Like I love the opportunity to reset and recalibrate and like have a different relationship b- between being a morning person and being a night person. And like all, I think it's just, it's just thrilling, but I think I'm like the only one in the world. <laughs> you are the first person I have ever heard say anything like that. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, the, the, the fall back is nice. You know, oh, it's brilliant. Hour of sleep. Uh, but uh, the spring forward is, is rough for those of us who have to get up early and don't really naturally do so. Yeah. Yeah. I was so convinced that, that being the host of Green Mountain Mornings was going to make me a morning person. Nope. <laughs> well, it, it makes you a morning person by force, but it makes you absolutely useless, like in the mid-afternoon. Yep. Yeah, about one one o'clock in the afternoon, I was pretty useless. Yep. Um, but Speaking we of- are actually <laughs> here <laughs> to talk about town meeting, which happened um, in most communities last week. Um, if not town meeting, then local elections. And... Thank you, John, for joining us and and helping us with our what's kind of becoming an annual tradition of seeing what happened in in town meeting. And my first question that I've just been can't wait to ask you is, you know, last during the elections and I think last town meeting uh, as well in 2022, you were kind of clocking. uh, I think you were calling them the stealth Republicans. You were you were clocking like a series of of elections for very conservative um, candidates. I'm wondering how did that play out in town meeting? Are you seeing that more conservative people were elected? Did you see less conservative people elected? Give us the roundup on that one. <laughs> uh. I, I saw a lot less of them, actually. Um, you know, last fall, the vast majority of those stealth conservatives lost, uh, which is mostly because, you know, mostly because they were in very safe Democratic districts for the most part, uh, but also because they generally were terrible candidates. Um, this winter, um, you know, I was on the lookout. I put out calls to my readers saying, you know, if you hear of somebody, some nut who's running for the school board, you know, let me know. And uh, because you can always find, you know, traces of their nuttiness on their social media feeds or any background, you know, any stuff you come across on the internet. Um, and I got very little response. I got some. Um, and I know that the uh, the Democratic Party was also tr- sort of uh, trolling for these candidates to try to expose them, and they also got very little response. And I think to some extent this may be because the stealth conservatives are getting smarter about you know covering their tracks, but mostly I think it's that there, there just weren't that many of them this time. 
uh, for whatever reason. Maybe they got discouraged by losing all the time. Um, maybe they just took the winter off. I don't know. Uh, we'll see in 2024. But um, uh, there wasn't much of it this time around, which uh, was good for my blog because there was a ton of stuff to write about in the legislature. And if mm -hmm. I had to cover a lot of these candidates, which I enjoy doing, uh, it would have taken up uh, too much time. <laughs> And, you know, once in a while, one of these people does get elected, um, and that's bad for, <laughs> for our, our politics and our, our tradition of civility. Um, so um, I'm just as glad to not have that problem, uh, mm -hmm. at least apparently. Well, I think you noted in a couple blog posts uh, over the last week, you noted that even... Um, a number of elections had gone more progressive candidates mm -hmm. and in Burlington and Rutland. Well, Burlington actually went sort of like center left. Uh, Rutland was a, a liberal sweep, which is ah, so very, relieving that Rutland. Very unusual for Rut Rutland. They had, uh, they have a group there called Rutland Forward, which is trying to, they're not a dogmatic progressive, hard left group by any means. Uh, they're sort of center left, if anything, but you know, they're trying to move Rutland forward past the, you know, sort of the angry disputes of recent memory about things like uh, the Raider nickname for their high school and, and the, uh, uh, the uh, ill-fated plan to, to uh, settle 100 Syrian families uh, in, in the city, uh, which would have been absolutely marvelous for the vitality of Rutland. But and the deep hatred of all of the folks that are unhoused in their community. Yes. Um, so Rutland Forward ran um, uh, six candidates for uh, alderman or alder person or whatever. Um, they ran a candidate for mayor against a four-term incumbent who was running for re-election. Uh, and they ran two candidates for school board. And all nine of them won. Uh, and uh, one of the defeated longtime aldermen was a real uh, hard right conservative mm -hmm. who had, you know, done, said and done some obnoxious things about the Raider nickname and about sort of like making, you know, borderline racist statements here and there. Um, so he's out and Rutland Forward is in very much so. Um, so, you know, the, there that's that may be a sign of, of uh, you know, upswing for the Democrats uh, mm -hmm. who have been trying to turn Rutland County at least purple for quite a while now. Um, and uh, maybe they're starting to make some headway. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Burlington was a completely different story. Um, the progressives in Burlington kind of got their, their rear spanked. Um, this will be the first year uh, in more than a decade that the Democrats will have a functioning majority on city council in Burlington. Uh, it had been either a split uh, between Democrats, progs and uh, independents or a very narrow progressive majority. And now the progressives are in the minority uh, down to four seats out of 12. And, um, and the other thing was that uh, the progressives had very strongly backed a measure to set up a, uh, a police oversight commission, which would have been entirely separate uh, from the police department mm -hmm. um, with you know, substantial powers. And that got absolutely smoked, um, uh, defeated resoundingly. Um, there has been a lot of coverage of crime in Burlington in the last couple of years. Um, I'm not convinced that it's a real crime wave. It's more like a few high profile crimes that get breathless coverage in the media because it is an established narrative at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, you know, there are a lot of people in Burlington who feel less secure than they did a few years ago. Uh, and they voted that way. And it kind of leaves the Progressive Party um, kind of in the wilderness, you know, they haven't been able to make any progress really on the statewide level or in terms of the legislature, they've held their own and that's about it. Uh, but now the Burlington has been their, you know, wellspring uh, and their source of young candidates who might move up uh, and become the progressive stalwarts of the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
uh, that pipeline seems to be, uh, it's not closed, but it's uh, occluded, let's say. What, uh, I, what I've sort of seen less coverage of, and I think you mentioned in passing in one of your blog posts, John, um, is that the progressives in Burlington, I think partly because they were running such like young, new, vital candidates, have not had folks sort of stick around for multiple election cycles. And I've had really like a rash of resignations yep. mid session. And yeah. I think like, as much as I want to say that people are like voting on policy um, or that this is like deeply meaningful about sort of the future of people's attitudes in a community, I, I really want to sort of put a lot of emphasis on voter trust and um, yeah. folks not running for second terms or resigning midterm and what that does for, you know, voters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they relationship just, to party voters, relationship to candidates, voters, relationship to young candidates, all of it. Um, you know, Hannah was elected and this was sort of her second run. She'd been sticking around, you know, she'd like I feel like that is in some ways more meaningful to voters than any particular policy statements or caucusing that anyone does. Certainly is no, um, you know, uh, well of trust to draw on. For the progressives mm -hmm. because they have had people resign or not seek re-election they had two counselors resign last september alone mm -hmm. uh the guy who ran for mayor and almost won max tracy in 2021 uh left council after that um the progressives drummed out two veteran progressive counselors who were deemed not insufficiently pure um so they have uh, in many ways shot themselves in the foot and in many ways, as Emily said, um, it's a natural consequence of having young people run for office who are still sort of establishing their lives. And in some cases they had to get on with their lives. Uh, you know, it's, uh, but it has left the Progressive Party with uh, a, a thin bench of people who basically nobody knows. Right. Well, so, it's, it puts the um, Rutland Forward um, candidates in in a cautious light, I think, because we put so much emphasis on getting elected mm -hmm. in, in our cultural narratives. We don't put as much emphasis on what it takes to actually serve. <laughs> um and so <laughs> and I want, the rutland forward candidates are like they are not like lefty candidates they're like very like they are running on a platform of like let's have like a cheerful forward-looking optimistic city like they are just like nice good folks who want a friendly community for all like it's really like they are not political purists they are right, not but just because yes. they got their slate of folks elected Absolutely. doesn't mean they they'll be able to govern yeah. 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 And governing's hard. And they, speaking they of governing, them. I think the Brattleboro elections um, were actually quite, they were quite striking. And so I think, you know, let's save the just cause eviction for sort of a second piece of this. Um, but the, you know, the nature of the select board elections in Brattleboro um, were really striking. Mm -hmm. Um you know, there was sort of two female incumbents that the social media vitriol against them was really quite striking. Um, the amount of blame around town manager resignations and changes and the EMS services um, from sort of a, it's again, it's like this governing versus politicking. And mm -hmm. there's a lot that happens when you're governing that you can't even, you know, is one, just hard to explain on social media, but two, like, a lot, you know, HR issues just can't be discussed for the most right. part. Right. And it was really just like very, it was troubling for me to see the extent to which these two women were pilloried mm -hmm. in the name of sort of progress. And then like, you know, white middle-aged older men were elected as if they were gonna be like, you know. The saviors. The saviors of, govern of good governance. It was just, yeah. it was quite wild to watch. Yeah. I missed a lot of the, I, I've, 
been keeping kind of away from social media lately, so I hadn't seen a lot of the what Jessica and and Liz were experiencing. But just sitting on the outside now that I'm looking over the mountains at Brattleboro, I what I found so interesting was how we define power. You know, I think. I'll just talk about Jessica for a minute because um, as the incumbent, she wasn't reelected. And I find that so sad because I think she has a really nice way of leading. Um, it's, it's thoughtful, it's gentle, it considers all sides. Um, and I thought it was a nice addition to the mix that was on the select board. Mm -hmm. And yet I fully understand that a lot of people do not look at that as leadership or power. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Franz and, and uh, Fish, as much as I, I, I adore both of them, they do have that like typical alpha male leadership style. Um, and especially when there is a perception that things are not running very well, mm -hmm. you know, people can fall back on that, you know, um, sort of confident whether they it's justified or not leadership style. Um, they voters take some comfort in that when things seem to be going off the rails a little bit. Um, so, you know, between the turnover and uh, city government and homelessness and uh, housing issues and, you know, whatever else is troubling the people of Brattleboro. Um, you know, this was not so much a turn to the right as a turn to status quo uh, or, you know, um, trying to find a safe harbor, let's say. Well, and, you know, what was interesting is sort of people were upset from the center and people were upset from the left. Um, and I saw folks, you know, talking about Dick de Grey in glowing terms, which I honestly, like in my time in Brad, I mean, have never seen. He's like, I respect that he keeps on showing up for town government and like putting in his time, but like a solid like governance character he is not. He is, you know- He, he could be a little divisive on-, he's on Quite divisive and quite conservative. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that like sort of that was, people lost track of that reality in the context of just like this drive to oust these two people was remarkable to me. Mm -hmm. And Emily, just on what you saw on, on social media, how much do you feel it was governing styles and how much do you feel it was just straight up gender issues? I mean, I don't know if there's ever a difference between those two things necessarily. <laughs> um, yeah, I have no idea. I don't know how to answer that. Um, I think, you know, there's governance. So like Liz actually has like a fairly forward, say what she says, what mm. she thinks governing style, which in a woman is considered sort of like alienating, divisive, you know, bossy. authoritarian, bossy, right? Um, Jess has a very sort of thoughtful, moralistic, um, calm, Govern curious governance style, which is thought of as weak. Mm -hmm. um, between the two of them, they're both fairly like careful with an eye towards governance, not politics. And yeah. a select board that's thinking about politics is not a functional select board. I mean, most of the time they're like talking about just the most boring stuff ever. So <laughs> it's really, you know, and how much of this is just, you know, like it's all on Zoom now and, you know, mm -hmm. all of those things. It's really, so people can like, watch the Zoom and snark together in a way that people wouldn't necessarily watch public access and be engaged in the conversation the way they would have been before. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, so we have, um, I'm just looking at the time and I'm trying to craft some, how to use that well. Um, and I feel there's still a little bit more to talk about but I, I am curious, Emily, you know, we, we put a lot of emphasis on town meeting and the local elections, as I feel we should. And yet, I'm curious how much of what happened last week across Vermont, uh, for example, three, three towns voted on just cause evictions 
two passed, one did not. Um, how much of that will influence your work as a lawmaker going forward? Or are they two very different things in your mind? Um, I think if something like just cause eviction passes in a wide range of communities, that influences the conversation around just cause eviction. Mm -hmm. I think even if just cause eviction had passed in Brattleboro, Burlington, Winooski, that it would still like be like, oh, this is, you know, a lefty extremist urban thing still. Right? <laughs> um, it needs to pass in Rutland um, <laughs> to like actually change my work, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what is actually incredibly influential in conversations in the legislature is school board budgets passing. Oh. And what we saw across the state was really one of the two school board budgets that failed, failed because it was too low to my mm -hmm. understanding of the, you know, the cover. I haven't talked to anyone in the town, but what I've read so far is that, you know, the Barry school budget was voted down because it did not spend enough money. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's one of the lowest spending districts in the state. And well, specifically so, enough money on kids is what yes. people have said. Yeah. Yes. Um. And so that makes a huge difference. The fact that Vermonters come back over and over again to vote for their kids and their kids' education, that makes a huge difference in policy conversations in the legislature. Because mm -hmm. yeah, uh, was... for me, it means that like people are also saying like, I believe in the power of taxes to make a difference in my community. And so every time like, a group of Vermonters says that it's incredibly affirming to any other work that I would do in terms of raising revenue in support of the greater good. Mm -hmm. the, the other well, and local happened, and public education. Yeah. Sorry, John. The other thing that happened in Rutland was they had three uh, bond proposals for infrastructure improvements, and all three won very handily yep. by lopsided margins. And you know, the school budgets are the the number one example of there being absolutely no sign of a taxpayer revolt in Vermont. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as I can tell, you know, other municipal spending issues did very well also. Um, so yeah, people are perfectly willing to invest in what they see as, you know, a functioning government uh, doing good things. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering for both of you, do you feel that the influx of ARPA funds giving people a, a little more breathing room, do you think that perhaps has helped with some of the, the, the votes towards municipal projects specifically? I think the influx of ARPA funds has helped people realize what can happen when there's money available in their communities. I think a lot mm. of those bond issues for construction are um, in some communities being really nicely threaded together with ARPA money so that people can feel that something is possible and they're not just like pushing the boulder up the hill. Um, I think in for schools, a lot of school boards saw what would hap what happened when they were able to spend on social emotional learning with ARPA dollars and now are carrying that forward in their school budgets. Um, people feel the need to pay teachers adequately, that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know if sort of individual ARPA, like if individual federal money in people's pockets is creating space for spending. Um, I feel like a lot, what I've seen is that a lot of that savings has really um, diminished and Vermonters are fairly close in terms of their savings to where they were pre-pandemic at this point. Yeah. Thank you. It has injected the public sector with a sense of purpose and a, a visible sense of accomplishment. Um, you know, as we begin the actual work of building out broadband in rural areas, uh, that is just getting started. And assuming that that goes according to plan, uh, that will be a massive uh, display of what government can do when it has enough money to tackle a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, we have a couple minutes left, so I will share something I noticed from Whitingham's town meeting. Ooh, I don't did know. Did you go to Whitingham's town meeting? I did. I actually took, um, I was lucky. I had some vacation time, some comp time. So I took that to go to Whitingham's town meeting. Um, and I was there. Not that to you're the bitter a end, and I. What's that, John? You're a politics nerd or anything? 
Oh no, no. And I didn't take notes and then end up writing something for the commons anyways, because I was there. So I might as well. <laughs> um, but one thing I had, I found so fascinating is there were people who happened to be sitting near me who they were there when the doors opened and they stayed until the doors closed and they sat in the voting section and they paid absolute attention to everything the moderator said and every vote that was taken and yet they said nothing the whole time they didn't vote for they didn't vote against they were like this silent i don't know i i don't know uh maybe well, you've something... been to a lot of town meetings i so i've never been to any no i guess i went to one of the marlboro town meeting once but mostly i just go to the brattleboro one which is its whole own special weird thing right. Is that like a thing that happens that people just go and don't vote? Have you ever this seen was that? the first time I've ever noticed it. And and I find that absolutely fascinating that you would spend your whole day there. I mean, definitely they were engaged. They took time off of work or for whatever they were doing from their day. Hmm. And yet I, I think they voted by Australian ballot. I saw them go through that the line, but from the floor. Nothing the whole time. Now, a couple times I forgot to vote because as a reporter, for so many years, I was in the background just taking notes and not not actually voting on anything. So there are a few times I was like, oh, wait, yep, I can vote. <laughs> I can say yay. Um, so keep your eye out the next time you go to a town meeting, see if it's if it's just a Whitingham thing or if it's a town meeting thing thing. And I'm fascinated by why someone would do that just me I can't so I would have definitely asked by the end of the time and I am so fascinated that you didn't also I, I didn't because I yeah I yeah. got a little shy but I yeah now I'm regretting it <laughs> that I didn't ask I'm gonna see this poor person one of these people in the grocery store one day I'll be like so I remember why didn't you and they'll be like <laughs> Which will definitely be like 12 times weirder than if you had asked at the time. Oh, totally. Totally. But why not go for the more the the more weird version, right? Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, so folks, stay tuned. The Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro will return after we hear from some of our underwriters. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us on Brattleboro Community Television and many of the peg stations around the state, thanks to BCTV. And wherever you subscribe to pop podcasts, you can find us there as well. If you're just joining us, I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I'm speaking with regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser, as well as journalist John Walters from the Vermont Political Observer. And Emily, we need to remind people of something. The views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the hosts and the guests, respectively, not the station, nor the platform, nor their employers, nor friends, nor the birds that seems to be returning to the fields, which I am also very excited about, but it is not the opinion of the birds, it's just us. Not the opinion, of, we need that on a t-shirt. The Montpelier happy hour, not the opinion of the birds. <laughs> 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 um, I want to talk quickly, uh, folks, about the vote in Brattleboro around just cause um, evictions. I was surprised that uh, I really thought just sitting on the outside looking in that it would have passed. And at least according to the commons, it was um, one, 100, 1,221 to 656 mm -hmm. against, I believe. Um, curious from either of you watching this. I have so many opinions. <laughs> um, I'm curious before I like dive deep into my sort of inside angle here, John, what your thoughts on it are. Well, from from my, you know, two hours distant from Brattleboro perch, um, you know, you would you would have thought uh, at first glance, relying on, you know, uh, stereotypes of, of communities that Brattleboro would have been the most likely to jump on this. 
uh, rather than the one to turn it down by a two to one margin, essentially. Uh, so yeah, it was a surprise, um, but that is an uninformed surprise. Uh, so, you know, hopefully maybe uh, Emily can shed a little more light on how this happened. So I think there are a few things. One, the just cause eviction conversations have been going on a lot longer up north than they have down here. Mm. I think even the idea of just cause eviction is actually a fairly brand new conversation to Brattleboro, really yeah. just this election cycle and started quite late. Um, really like just squeaked into the petition on the ballot. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas in Burlington, it's been going on for, you know, years and years and years. Um, I think conversations around rent control are actually, or um, conversations around security deposits, that's like, for whatever reason, much more normal to the Brattleboro politic is sort of the money side and not the right side. So there's that. It was a new idea to people. Mm -hmm. um, other things about this. And, yeah, go. Sorry, I'm just going to jump in okay. quickly. We should remind listeners that it was kind of a two-part question. It was just cause evictions, but also a what a twelve percent cap on rent, mm -hmm. yearly rent raises, and that part really got like no conversation, no coverage whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, the rent raising part. So, other pieces of the puzzle here. One, I think Brattleboro renters are disproportionately housing trust and how um housing authority renters. Hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than market rent. Um, and I think in some, and folks who are paying, who do have private landlords in Brattleboro, I think a large proportion of those are tend to be smaller landlords than mm -hmm. in um, the Burlington area. Yeah. So that's one. So the mix of folks matters because interestingly, folks who live in housing trust properties and housing authority properties yep are already subject to just cause eviction protections. Exactly, yep, yep. So there's that. Um, Brattleboro also has a fairly long history of folks who live, um, and I think this might be true across the state, but maybe less so in the Burlington Nexus, renters are much less likely to vote, especially mm. in local elections. Um, so the sort of the smaller the election, the less likely they are to vote. So there's that. Um, we have, at this point, there was an organized tenants association pre-pandemic. It fizzled during the pandemic. So there was no tenants association whatsoever to be organizing this from. And so the organizing on it actually started from scratch in the fall. Mm -hmm. That is a very quick turnaround to organize disenfranchised voters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The landlords in town, however, have been having lunch together multiple times a month at a local Chinese restaurant, I think since the beginning of time. Um, They're quite organized. And I think they became even more organized after the um, the ordinance change around first and last month's rent and security deposits. Yes. Um, and there are a number of landlords sort of connected to that landlords group that do a lot of section eight rentals and um, do a lot of sort of like last chance renting and consider themselves very good folk because they are profiting off of extremely poor people. Um, and I guess they don't have to, they could be profiting off of someone else. Um, so there's sort of like that landscape. Um, the organizing for the Just Cause Eviction in Brattleboro was led by Rights and Democracy. Mm -hmm. um, as it was led by Rights and Democracy all around the state. Rights and Democracy has no organization whatsoever in Brattleboro. Right. There are right. other parts of the state where they have a full membership, regular meetings. For instance, I was not endorsed by Rights and Democracy this year because there was no one at the Rights and Democracy endorsement meeting who knew me, like who knew Brattleboro or knew me, right? Mm -hmm. So the... Like, so it was being organized from afar. And frankly, it was being, you know, when the one, the first organizing meeting I went to with Tristan and Molly, where we spoke about sort of what we would do if this passed and like how we would support it in the legislature and talked about, you know, what tenant power meant in the context of capitalism and all these things. Um, 
and all spoke supportively for it while recognizing that it was a town issue and not a legislative issue yet. Um, the person who was organizing it was like very clearly someone from out of town, very clearly someone who, you know, um, didn't know the folks in town. That first organizing meeting had two tenants at it and a whole lot of landlords who had heard about it already. Oh, interesting, interesting. And so it was supposed to be an organizing meeting wound up to be incredibly combative. And the organizer of the meeting didn't pivot um, mm. to, whoa, look who my audience is. Maybe we should have a different kind of conversation here. And so it was sort of like, it was a little doomed from the start in that way um, because it didn't come from sort of um, as locally born as it could. It was also all mixed up with another organization in Brattleboro called Common Sense, um, oh, yeah. okay. which um, because of sort of their tactics and strategies is not always um, sort of considered viable by like center left governance minded people. And then there's just like just cause evictions really complicated and the ballot measure was really complicated and like a whole lot of people didn't understand what it meant. And so when they looked to understand what it meant, the person who explained to them what it meant was of someone who owned property. Right. So maybe that's an over analysis, but I do think like with more and better and longer term organizing, something different could come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, the one thing I did take away from some of the conversations uh, when people came to me to talk about it and I'd be like, I'm not in Brattleboro anymore, folks. Um, uh, and in full disclosure, you know, folks know my day job is with Stevens and Associates and they do own the Brooks House, which is a lot of units. I don't know what my colleagues thought on the just, um, the just cause eviction uh, measure was. We just never had a moment to talk about it. So I, I don't know what their feelings were. Uh, however, a number of folks who came to me happened to be small landlords. And when I say small landlords, they had like an auxiliary apartment or maybe they owned two units, but really very kind of small. Um, and I did think it was worth acknowledging how many of them were concerned. You know, many of them had horror stories about tenants that had um damaged the buildings or uh been in a state of crisis that was more than the landlord was capable of supporting um and i did think it was worth at least hearing those concerns yeah because i do feel sometimes that as much as we want to take care of each other as a community sometimes we ask people with absolutely no skill or training to support people who really need mm -hmm. help and support. And um, that was some of what I heard coming from. And I, I have compassion for that, you know, as someone who was six years old when her mom got sick, you know, I was over my head as a six year old. I can only imagine what other people might be feeling. Um, so that was part of my takeaway. And when I say, you know, it, lacked organizing power. I think that's a lot of what was lacking. It was one, the fact that, you know, auxiliary units were exempt from the rules, but like no one seemed to know that. Good point. Right. Um, yep. And that eviction is not banned, right? <laughs> so like all of those examples that kept on getting brought up over and over again, we have a drug crisis and dealers are, it's like, no, there's, there is in fact eviction proceedings that are allowable in all of these situations. Um, and what would it take to make eviction proceedings like more efficient in places right. where there's cause, right? And so like that was never part of the conversation really. And that is part of like really making sure that everyone across the conversation is having their concerns heard is what, mm -hmm. from, from my perspective, good organizing is. Well, I wonder if, you know, in the first half of the show, I asked you, Emily, how might some of this influence your work in the legislature? maybe that's where the legislature needs to step in and kind of look at something like its eviction policies mm -hmm. and see if there are ways that, you know, someone who has one unit and feels overwhelmed by the system, I don't know. 
Yeah, there actually are quite a few um, pretty robust systems in place in that case. It's people don't know of about them. And then that's like very hard to legislate. It's really like an administrative issue. And I don't think we need to start talking about the governor. This <laughs> so, um, but there is, there's a lot, you know, there's um, right now, there's a sort of shared landlord pool available with state money um, for repairs, essentially, for, and not for like improvement repairs, but for repairs related to just like any sort of destruction um, from tenants. Um, it's a risk pool. There's a whole lot of eviction mediation um, programs set up affiliated with various courts, but not part of the courts that um, legal aid works on. There are really like there, are, and then every sort of housing um, partnership in the community. So the um, affiliated with sort of the homelessness services in a community has a whole bunch of sort of case management, social work apparatus attached to it to assist um, with sort of coaching and counseling someone who's in, who might be a tenant who's struggling as a tenant to help them find a place where they might um, be more stable. Because once someone gets evicted, it's really, really hard to rehouse them. So housing right. providers, meaning nonprofit housing providers, not a euphemism for landlords, but housing providers <laughs> are really, really um, sort of deeply keyed into counseling tenants who are struggling or in Thank struggleful you. relationships with landlords. Thank you, Emily. Uh, John, what, what's your thoughts at this point? Well, it, it, it strikes me, and, and maybe I am extrapolating and punditizing too much here, but um, is, there, is there sort of a theme here in the Brattleboro results where, you know, we talked in the first half of the show about sort of a little bit of unease in the electorate and a sort of a retrenchment um, and, a, you know, falling back on, uh, you know, male leadership tropes. Um, if there is that kind of uncertainty in the air in Brattleboro, uh, that makes voters a lot less likely to support what seems like a brand new and somewhat radical idea, like just cause mm. eviction. So um, maybe they entered the, you know, the uh, the people campaigning for it kind of entered this whole thing behind the eight ball because of sort of the general attitude of the electorate. It's mm. a good question. Thank you. Um, for the time we have left, I'd like to quickly pivot to Crossover Week, which actually we're pre-recording this show on Monday. I believe Crossover for Policy Bills happens tomorrow, Emily. Is that So it's, it's this coming week. So when this is aired on Friday, we will be wrapping up Policy Crossover Week. And so mm -hmm. any policy bills that basically any bills that need to um, make it to the Senate in time for the Senate to pick them up are, or the, make it to the House in time for the House to pick them up, need to leave the opposite body by, be voted out by, um, voted out of their committee. Right. By this Friday. And so, John, are there any bills you're kind of watching? Um, well, I could probably name a whole bunch, uh, because this is the point, you know, when, when we convened in January, uh, democratic leadership had a pretty ambitious agenda with a number of, you know, pretty large bills, uh, in hand. And when, when the Democrats have a historic supermajority, expectations are high. Uh, and this is the time when the expectations meet the reality of a very limited calendar and the in inherent difficulty of moving large uh, and substantial pieces of legislation. So a number of bills are, are kind of, you know, falling off the fast track. Uh, they, so they probably won't hit crossover. Um, that is okay because you know we're in the first of a, a two-year cycle here and any bill that doesn't make it across the finish line this year gets a fresh start next january um, but it is the time when a lot of the the sort of like the the hope that springs in early january meets the reality of how difficult it is to legislate 
Uh, so I see a number of bills that are kind of either falling off the fast track or are being uh, moderated. Uh, mm. or, or if, if you want to be unfriendly about it, eviscerated. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, the ambitions are being pulled back in a lot of ways or, or put off to the future. Um, so yeah, it's a time for sort of a reality check, I guess. That's, that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. What kind of reality checks are you experiencing right now, Emily? Well, I'm still feeling very hopeful about some big banner bills that I'm attached to, but I will sort of, um, I do regularly reflect on the wisdom of former representative Matt Treber, who in, I think my third week in the legislature, still like, you know, fresh faced, hopeful and lost, stopped me in the hallway and said, you know, to survive in this building, you have to be willing to drown your babies in the bathtub. <laughs> and at the time I thought, gosh, you're the meanest, darkest man that's ever lived. But I do think he was correct. And um, I don't think he meant that you need to, um, you know, kill anyone, certainly not kill young, vulnerable creatures. But in order to sort of stay stable, it's really, really hard to fall in love mm. with a piece mm. of legislation because that legislation is gonna change. That said, I am in love with the family medical leave insurance bill and I think it's gonna leave the house almost as strong as it joined us. Now, who knows what's gonna happen in the Senate? <laughs> Probably some baby drowning, but right now I feel really, really great about the strength of that bill and the policy pieces of that bill, the financial aspects of that bill. I think it's beautiful. Um, I think we're still doing some really strong work on housing, though um, we're preparing for some really strong work on child care. Mm -hmm. Some really great suicide protection work has happened. Um, good, good, good. I also, um, you know, feel frustrated um, around, you know, that opioid work has not passed out yet. I'm hopeful that it's going to pass out of the Human Services Committee this week. Um, the banner bill that seems to be attached to that doesn't have safe use sites in it. Um, mm -hmm. And that might move separately, which gives me a lot of feelings um, coming from a community where so many people have died and that yeah. is so incredibly ready for that legislation. And the homelessness, the housing for homeless folks is just like a political nightmare um, in terms of sort of money and courage and how that's playing out and how, you know, the conversations that my caucus is having about it right now. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, I wrote a piece recently about how uh, providing housing for the homeless, uh, leaving out the entire moral dimension mm. about, you know, treating your fellow human beings like they're human beings, that it is just simply on economic terms a winner yeah. that if you provide stability for people who don't have any uh, they are much more likely to enter the workforce and be reliable participants in the workforce the vast majority of people who are living on the edge don't want to be there they want to have a job and they want to have a place to live and they want to have a car and you know they they don't want to be you know uh, worrying about where they're going to spend the night tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, or even tonight. Um, so to me, I mean, you know, when we we look at business programs like you know we invest this money up front in you know uh, tax increment financing or in uh, the veggie grants or you know this or that, we look at that as an investment that will pay off down the road. Mm -hmm. We don't treat human beings the same way. And which is very odd that's not only inhumane it's a gross mistake in, in purely economic terms thank and, you john and that doesn't um, get through to you know the people who are making the decisions unfortunately i i totally agree john and it's um and it's interesting I think there's a temptation for us to sort of negotiate against ourselves or pre-negotiate, you know, based mm. on what we expect the Senate to do or based on what we expect the governor to do. Um, 
and the sort of the real politic of that is really sort of troubling when it's like real people's lives. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it, it makes people, people who voted for, voted to give the Democrats super majorities, it makes them wonder what they voted for. Exactly. The Democrats can't deliver on, on big issues. Mm -hmm. Now they are delivering on some, as Emily said, it's not fair to only point out the ones where, where things are, are you know, hitting rocky waters, but, um, you know, something as central to, you know, making Vermont a good place to live as solving the homeless crisis is not getting anywhere in a predominantly democratic legislature, then that's, that's not good. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and especially after the, the progress that was made during COVID to mm -hmm. keep people housed, we, we really don't have an excuse mm -hmm. not, not to make it happen. Yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so Emily, walk us through just quickly kind of the process for crossover week and then what people can expect for the rest of the session. Just like um, procedurally. Procedurally. So yeah. this week, policy bills will get voted out of their committees. They will then, most of them get referred to a money committee. That's the Ways and Means Committee where I am or the Appropriations Committee. And then often after the Ways and Means Committee, they need to go to the Appropriations Committee. And so next week, they will get voted out of those committees if they can. Um, and then they'll go to the House floor or the Senate floor um, and then be voted out of there. Um, in these two weeks, there's a lot of places that things can sort of dissolve. There's it not getting out of its policy committee, but just as likely as the fact that there's a little bit of a backup this year because there are so many new members. So policy committees were moving kind of slow. Mm. And so it's possible there just won't be enough time on the money committees to get everything across the finish line. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's possible that, you know, there's bills that are in the policy committees or in the money committees that haven't sort of gotten the pulse of the body yet. Um, and so they might not be appropriate to come to the House floor because the House floor might not be ready for them or the Senate floor might not be ready for them. And so things get held up in that way, too. And then so sometime in the next three weeks, we'll sort of see what's going to make it over to the other body. And then we'll see what the body, the other body picks up because they're not mm -hmm. obligated to pick up all the bills that get sent to them. They just need to get there in time. Um, so sort of everything is still on the table. And just because something doesn't get voted out in time doesn't mean it can't get tacked onto something that got sent over. So there's point. like always a, there's always a path for everything and everything also has an opportunity to not pass, I guess I'd say. <laughs> the way I put it is if the legislature wants to get something done, they find a way. And if they don't want to get something done, they find a way to kill it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, please, like, let us never underestimate the impact of our lack of time, lack of staffing in terms of, like, sometimes things don't pass because we just don't have the resources or the organization to get it done at this point. And it's not because someone wants to or doesn't want to. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Uh, just a minute left, John. What do we want to leave listeners with before we head out? Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll mention something that um, I, I see a few storm clouds on the horizon. Um, one of the legislature's top priorities this year is the Affordable Heat Act, yeah. which passed the Senate uh, with barely enough support to override a veto. Um, there is a huge amount of activity in the grassroots and in the you know fossil fuel community and in the conservative media sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, about how this is going to, you know, bankrupt Vermonters and, and won't accomplish anything. And um, I fear that that tide of opposition might, uh, might derail, if not derail the bill, it will certainly make passage a lot more fraught, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it will take some courage on behalf of assuming it, that's coming from the Senate to the House, uh, and assuming it gets to the House, you know, then you know, the people in, in those committees will, will need a little bit of courage to um, take up this bill when there's a lot of noise and a lot of inaccurate stuff being said about it. And they it have, was they have to look at the Princeton. most discussion in Whiting Hamstown meeting. Yeah. They have, they not only have to pass it, they have to pass it 
with preserving the veto proof uh, majority because we assume that Governor Scott is going to veto it if it gets to him. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little worried about that bill. And if that bill doesn't pass, that'll be a major failure for, for this, this session. Thank you. Emily, any last thoughts before we head out? Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in the next two weeks. And um, I'm gonna keep my hope that I have on this beautiful Monday morning as the birds come to town. And <laughs> let's see if when we talk in two weeks, I'm still still. <laughs> Thank you. So Emily, if folks want to connect with you, how can they do that? Folks can go to emilycornheiser.org and you'll find links to my email address, my phone number, um, regular newsletter updates, any way to find me or get in touch. Great. John, how about you? Uh, well, my blog is the Vermont Political Observer, which is the vpo.org. Um, if you Google Vermont Political Observer, you will find me very readily. Uh, I am also on Twitter for the, uh, you know, the, the dwindling few uh, <laughs> Vermont political people who are still on Twitter. Uh, the VPO won the number one because the VPO uh, was taken by the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra long ago. <laughs> so uh, I'm easy to find. Thank you. And as always, you can find the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro at 2 p.m. on Fridays, as well as our Captivate page wherever you subscribe to podcasts. And if you want to drop us a line, you can do so at the Montpelier Happy Hour at gmail.com. Have a great weekend, everyone.